Fungi. What did we talk about? Characteristics, right? What did we say fungi are? Eukaryotes, heterotrophs. What about cellularity? Mostly multicellular, right? But some unicellular examples. Um, ex using exoenzymes. What does that mean? What am I referring to when I'm talking about exoenzymes? Okay. Yeah, on the outside. And what are they using them for? What process? Digest. Yeah. But they're doing their uh, digesting externally. We talked about um, because they're all heterotrophs, no photosynthesizers in the group, even though traditionally they've been classified as plants. We talked about why. Because they go out and kind of look like plants, right? They act plantish. Um, and reproduction through spores. And sometimes done. So that's just their general characteristics. And then we looked at the tree just to look at, again at where they fall. We talked about some terminology for structure. So this is just labeling things, um, definitions. And then we were halfway through talking about our groups. We talked about Tetridio, uh, tri tetridio mycota. What was significant about those guys? Remember? The one the only, only motile yes, so the only ones that are modal. What does modal mean? Yeah, they can move around. How do they do it? What do they have? Flagella. And what do they cause? Who do they cause problems for? Anybody remember that? Yeah, frogs and other amphibians. Um, Tetrid fungi, because they are uh, flagellated and they swim, they're associated with water. Um, and so are amphibians, right? So that might be a helpful way to remember that, but they're causing this tetridiomycosis, which is basically a skin disease. If you are an amphibian and you breathe through your skin, that's problematic, right? So it's um, causing a number of species reductions in amphibians in, in the amphibian group. Okay, zygomycota, what was significant about this group? We didn't spend much time talking about it because there's not a whole lot really interesting going on. This is not a mycology class. Yeah. That spore thing that they produce in the center is like the chain. Yep. Tough zygosporangia, making that diploid zygote in that tough case that you can even microwave if you get, feel the need to do so. Okay, so that's really it on that. Glomerulomycetes, we spent more time talking about what's significant about this group. What do they do that's really important for? Every other life form sort of above the base of the food chain. Okay, remember? Yeah, they they support plants, right? They have a, a symbiotic relationship. We went through these terms: the mycorrhizae, our muscular mycorrhizae, meaning tree shaped, right? We talked about this. The fungal hyphae are associated closely with plant roots. They invade the cell wall, but not the cell membrane. So they're not completely inside the plant cell, but they're almost there. Really, really tight connection. And what do they do? What is this relationship based on? They share something. What do they share? Hmm? Sugar. Yeah, uh, nutrients, right? So sugar coming from the photosynthetic partner or the plant, and inorganic nutrients come from the fungus part. So they swap. Um, and this is really important because plants aren't that good at getting inorganic nutrients out of the soil with their big fat roots. Right, fungal hyphae are smaller, much, much smaller. You can sort of see that scale. Um, so they're better at getting down into the particulate matter of the soil and picking up soil solution, which is where all those inorganic nutrients are dissolved. Like nitrogen, right, that's been fixed by who? You guys remember? Who lives in the soil and does nitrogen fixation? This is review. Are we we talked about prokaryotes, remember? That was one of the ecological benefits of prokaryotes. We spent a ton of time talking about how uh, many terrible diseases bacteria can cause. But then we spent a little bit of time talking about some benefits, and that was one of them, right? Most living things can't fix atmospheric nitrogen, but soil bacteria can do it. So they do that. So there's this nice organic nitrogen source in the soil, but plants have these big fat roots, right? They can get some on their own, but they're not as efficient as the fun fungal hyphae so the hyphae can get that inorganic uh, nutrition that so those two they share. So it's important because remember we said eighty percent of plant species depend on this symbiotic relationship with Fumara mycota. So it's a small group. There's only one hundred and sixty species or so in this group, but um, they're really important. Sorry, really important in uh, supporting plant growth, which supports the food chain for us 
big eaters, right? All right. That gets us to ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. You guys are getting off the hook for sure, because part of what I slashed was life cycles of these things, so you don't have to do that. Um, what I want you to know is a couple of facts um, about each of these two groups. Let me go back just a couple of slides to this one. These are the by far the majority of fungi fall into the ascomycota or the basidiomycota. Okay, just about every mushroom that you're familiar with is in one of these two groups. Okay, um, so they're huge, diverse groups of organisms. They're separated from each other by uh, their life cycle, sort of. That's kind of how they're separated here. Um, and the big difference, wait for it, it's terribly exciting. Uh, Ascomycetes make eight spores per reproductive structure. The Basidiomycetes make four. It's the number of spores, best way to tell them apart. Am I gonna make you count spores? Probably not, definitely not, right? But that's how you can do it. Um, a couple of examples, so Asco, um, gives that root word comes from um, the word ascus, which means sac. And the ascus is the reproductive structure in these in these particular mushrooms. So sometimes they're called sac fungi. The fruiting body is the ascocarp. Okay, that is the part that looks like a mushroom. So most of the mushroom uh, tissues, most of the vegetative structures, or the structures that are uh, involved in growth, metabolism, nutrition, um, are all going to be those hyphae that you see underground. So this, this is the vegetative portion. When it's time to reproduce, that's when you see a mushroom pop up above the soil. So these guys that we see and eat are the fruiting bodies. In the ascomycetes, goes that that's the ascocarp, and that's the fruiting body itself. Um, in the basidia, basidiomycetes, that's the basidiocarp. Okay, so when you see carp, just think mushroom or fruiting body. So this is the part that's gonna actually produce the spores and the spores are going to be the reproductive cells, right? That spread and land and germinate, just like you think about seeds. And we'll talk about that when we get to plants. Because um, some plants use spores as well, but spores are going to be germinative, um, basically embryos, right? Give rise to embryonic uh, fungi. So that's what we're looking at there. Ascomycetes, again, fruiting body of the ascocarp. Uh, spores are formed inside the acai. That's the plural for ascus. Okay, so each ascus again produces eight spores. Okay, because we're going to skip all this. Even though it's really fascinating stuff, we're going to skip life cycles. Um, we're going to skip asexual reproduction and go straight to basidiomycetes. So you're welcome. Um, so the basidiomycota are called club fungi as opposed to sac fungi, and it has to do again with their reproductive structure. Um, in this case, it's the basidia. Singular is basidium, and each one makes four spores. So again, it's just a reproductive strategy. And the other cool thing to know about this group is, is this. If you eat mushrooms from the grocery store, it's probably a basidiomycete. And so those are the ones that you think of, um, regular old field mushrooms, uh, the white ones. If you go just buy like a container at the grocery store, right? Um, shiitakes, portobellos, those are just big field mushrooms, basically. So any of the ones that you buy at the grocery store are going to be in this group. Mushroom done with pizza, probably this is your mic. Um, that's it for those groups. So again, we're going to skip life cycle for, for the sake of time. Um, this does not say not on exam, but this is not really groundbreaking information. It's just talking about how they do their life cycle. Again, you guys don't need to know the details, but I left this in here because it shows that the Basidiomycetes make four spores and Ascomycetes make eight. So that's the only reason I even left this slide in here. It's another visual representation of the difference between the reproductive strategy of the two, which is one major way to tell them apart. Okay? Is that enough? You guys cool with that? I think so. Well, let's talk about some interesting examples from the fungi group. Of course, we start with pathogens. Like, right? what's a pathogen? You guys remind me. I'm going to call it this. Yep, causes disease in another organism. Uh, we mentioned this before. The pan. Sorry, I'm having trouble speaking this morning. Fungi can be parasites, pathogens, or even predators. Talk about those that can catch worms in the soil. Um, most fungal plant diseases that we worry about are those that affect crop plants. Why do we care about fungal infections in crop plants? Why don't we care about fungal infections in non-crop plants? 
thing yet? They don't affect what we eat, right? So um, human beings are very concerned about human beings, yes? So that's why we study the bacteria that cause disease and we don't pay attention to the ones that don't, right? That's why we study pathogenic fungi because we study the ones that affect us. So fungal diseases that affect plants uh, that we eat directly impact the human population, right? Now you might need a gardener who cares about other fungal infections that affect garden plants, right? Because maybe they're gardening for aesthetics and not food, but outside of that, most people don't care, right? So that's what I mean by saying most fungal plant diseases affect crops that, that we care about. Um, when they do that, they either cause tissue decay um, and death, or they cause a uh, loss of crop through toxin production. So they either make the crop inedible because it's rotten, or they make the crop inedible because it produces alkaloid toxins that cause uh, serious reactions in humans. Okay? If you eat it, you get super sick, or you <coughs> okay, in many cases. Um, an interesting species that we'll talk about in terms of um, crop infestation and effects on human beings is called Claviceps purpurea. It's also known as ergot fungus. Has anybody ever heard of ergot? What do you know about it? Anything? The Salem witch trials. Yeah. Do you, anybody ever heard that sort of connection between ergot and the Salem witch trials? Would, would you care to come to expound a bit or that's just the, you're giving that to me? Yeah. So um, basically it has to do with people acting crazy, right? So people are acting crazy and either you are a witch or you're acting crazy because a witch has cursed you, right? You guys are familiar with the Salem witch trials or at least have heard of them, yes? Okay. So basically they were killing a bunch of people, calling them witches, blaming all kinds of strange activities that were going on on these people. Um, I can't, 1700s, 1600s? I'm not a history buff, so I could be off of my dates. But anyway, the interesting thing here is that that's not, that's not solidly proven, but there's good evidence that the ergot fungus um, was causing this crazy behavior. But what happens is it infects uh, cereal crops, mainly rye, and the fungal infection itself reduces yield. So that's bad, right? Less food crop, but it also um, produces these alkaloid toxins that when eaten by a vertebrate, um, cause convulsions or seizures, hallucinations, gangrene. You guys know what gangrene is? When, you're, when you lose blood flow to your tissues and it dies, basically. Um, and milk to dry up in cattle. So it's problematic if you're feeding this to your cows, which is often what happens right, with cereal grains. Um, it's because your, your milk cattle dry up and that's never going to be good. They might also uh, seize and die in the field. Okay, So that's also bad. But if you yourself ingest it, the same thing can happen to you. Interestingly, some chemists back in the 1970s figured out how to modify the um, active the active toxin, the alkaloid toxin that's produced by ergot fungus, which happens to be lysergic acid. You guys ever heard of LSD? You have, nobody wants to say anything. Tell us that we know what it is. It's acid, right? Like tripping on acid, yes? <laughs> yeah, so drugs, right? <laughs> um, that, that's where it comes from. It's modified ergot fungus toxin. So yeah, anyway. Interesting, yes. Interesting tie into fungi. Maybe you knew, maybe you didn't. Uh, but that's Claviceps purpurea, so maybe make a mental note of that species name. Um, moving on to some other types of problems that fungi can cause for you. Um, animals, including us, can be poisoned by eating toxic mushrooms. You know that. You are um, very likely to get very ill if you eat certain types of mushroom um, or other fungi. Hypersensitivity to mold spores. Anybody have or know someone who has mold allergies? Okay, well, it's a thing. So just like power analogy, you can uh, inhale mold spores and your body reacts to it as if it's a foreign invader, just like it does with pollen. Um, so some people have trouble with that. Fungi can attack animals directly by growing on your tissues. So colonizing or moving in, making themselves at home, um, which is not good, destroys your tissue. Uh, we mentioned before that the term mycosis refers to fungal infections. Okay, mycoses, that's just the plural. So mycoses are fungal infections. Um, most are superficial. What does superficial mean? On the surface, yeah. So cutaneous means skin. Okay, so a lot of times fungal infections that you'll deal with as a human animal 
is um, our skin infections, things like fungus nails that are pictured here, right? The light bulbs, um, ringworm, athlete's foot, dock itch, et cetera, et cetera. Onychomycosis, that's the term for the fungus nail. So there's a reason that these are mostly superficial because the fungi are great at getting in. Okay, so they can sort of colonize the surface, but they don't do too well at getting into the bloodstream in most cases. So usually a cutaneous superficial mycosis is treatable with some powder from the birth of skin, right? Something like that, some cream or something. They're not usually going to be life-threatening, but there are instances of systemic mycoses. So systemic means full-on body systems, right? As opposed to just superficial or cutaneous in the skin. That means they spread internally. Okay, so these are more serious. Usually happens when spores are inhaled because, again, fungi aren't great at getting through your skin. Your skin's a pretty tough barrier right, to get through. So usually it happens when you inhale spores. So there are a couple examples here. Uh, I'm going to try. This one is always gets me. Coccidioidomycosis. In fact, we're going to practice to say that uh, with any speed at all. Also called valley fever. So there's, there's an easier name to pronounce. Fairly common in the southwest U.S. because it's dry and the spores can move around more easily in the dusty, uh, dry air. Causes respiratory symptoms similar to tuberculosis. So you don't want to deal with that. Histoplasmosis is another one. Um, it's also a lung infection. Pulmonary means lungs, if you guys aren't familiar with that term. Um, but this one's pretty bad because it can also cause swelling of the meninges. You guys know what meninges are? You ever heard of meningitis? You probably been, some of you may have been vaccinated against it. I think oftentimes um, in your late teens, they'll vaccinate you before you go off to college against um, meningitis. So your meninges are the connective tissue that surround your brain and spinal cord. So if they get inflamed, that is problematic. And that's what meningitis is. So you can actually get symptoms of meningitis from histoplasmosis. You can treat these systemic mycoses with antifungal medications. But antifungal medications have some pretty serious side effects. We'll talk about why in just a second. Also, antibiotics don't do a thing. Why? How come antibiotics don't work on fungal infections? Yeah, exactly. Not bacteria, right? Remember, antibiotics only treat bacterial infections, not viruses, not fungi, not protist parasites, just bacteria. Um, so let's think about this antifungal medication thing here. We talked about this same concept a little bit when we were talking about uh, making antiviral medications. We said it was difficult to uh, synthesize antiviral drugs because viruses use so much of your own cellular machinery, right? So if you create or develop a, a drug that interrupts those metabolic pathways that the virus is using, it might very well be your own metabolic pathway. Yes, you guys remember that? So antifungal drugs are kind of the same way. Um, how closely related are we to fungi in the big scheme of things? You're nodding, Roxanne, pretty close, right? Yeah, so remember, I'll go way back to the tree really quickly. We are oh, way back in the beginning. We're right here, right? If you take these protist groups out, system, right? So we're pretty closely related. That means that if we look at our cells, there are a lot of shared metabolic pathways. And we have a lot in common with that group. And so on the cellular level, we do things very similarly. So if you are interrupting fungal metabolic pathways, you might also be causing problems for your own cells, which is why oftentimes you can have pretty serious side effects when you're taking antifungal drugs systemically. Not the same as putting like Lotrimin on ringworm, right? A, a skin infection that's superficial. Those creams are pretty uh, innocuous. They'll kill the fungus, but won't hurt you. But systemically, it's different. Does that make sense? As to why? Um, this last little part is talking about opportunistic fungal infections. And we've mentioned opportunistic infections before. It's anything that takes advantage of an opening. Okay, so we mentioned it when we were talking about your microbiome. We we're talking about prokaryotes, bacteria, and how sometimes you get organisms that can sneak in when your balance is off because environmental conditions are wrong. Right? So your defenses are down. Um, that's when an opportunistic fungal infection or any other opportunistic infection can set in. So it's basically something that can take, take advantage of a weakened immune system, potentially. 
Um, Pneumocystis is a significant species or uh, genus of fungi that causes pneumonia. Okay, and it generally affects people who have AIDS. And I'm not talking about HIV, I'm talking about full blown acquired immune deficiency syndrome because you can't fight it off. So your defenses are down, right? Your T cells are low. You can't fight that infection. Um, a lot of AIDS patients die of pneumocystis pneumonia. Have you guys ever heard about that? Like that's one of the causes of, that people die from with AIDS. So AIDS doesn't kill you. The secondary infection that you get that you cannot fight off is what kills you. Okay, so pneumonia caused by this pneumocystis um, fungi is a, is a common is secondary infection in AIDS patients. So that's an example of opportunistic. Um, Candida is the same way. You guys have probably heard of yeast infections before, vaginal or oral, brush, things like that. So you always have yeast hanging around. It's kind of like part of your microbiome, microbiome just like bacteria. Um, and usually everything stays in sort of balance, but if your pH changes or you have had an infection, your immune defenses are down, your normal bacteria are altered, maybe you took a long course of antibiotics, sometimes that opens the door for normal, healthy levels of yeast to go crazy. And that's when you see things like yeast infections. So those are both opportunistic. Uh, generally, candida yeast infections are much less uh, impactful than something like pneumocystis, pneumocystis pneumonia in AIDS patients. Okay, but both are examples of opportunistic infections. Make sense? All right, so we talked about uh, tripping on acid. We talked about systemic and superficial mycoses and, and, and um, opportunistic infections. So let's switch gears and look at the good side. Okay, we're getting, getting to that. There are lots of benefits, just like what we talked about with protists, just like what we talked about with prokaryotes. There are ecological benefits and there are human specific benefits. So we'll do the same thing here, uh, looking at those. So um, also decomposers, right? So just like our other saprodes, just like bacteria, just like some protists that we talked about, breaking stuff down, decomposition, nutrient cycling, critically important, okay? Um, let's see, mycorrhizae, we talked about that with plants. So this is another little section, I'll come back up here to the lichens in just a second, talk about that. So this is another important mention of those mycorrhizal associations. Fungal hyphae, plant roots, sharing nutrients, right? The plants are supported by that, by that relationship. Um, they can be endomycorrhizal or ectomycorrhizal. We talked about endomycorrhizae in the glomerulomyces, right? What does endo mean? Inside. So it's those mycorrhizae that actually penetrate the uh, cell wall, okay? That the grow inside of the cell wall. Ectomycorrhizae don't do that. Ecto means what? Outside, yeah. So they're still really close, but they're not inside the cell. Um, again, 80 to 90% of all plants have mycorrhizal partners. We said 80% of those partnerships are with glomerulomycota. So that little group of fungi is really, really important. The other 10% are other groups and okay, not glomerulomycota. We're not going to focus too much on why because it doesn't matter. Just remember the glomerulomyces are the big important one. And then this is just the explanation of how that works. So the hyphae are better at channeling minerals, minerals and water from the soil. We talked about that exchange. Um, yeah, some plants won't even germinate, their seeds won't even sprout if they don't have the right fungi in the soil next to them. So critically important to plants. Um, the lichen thing is also symbiosis. We'll talk about that really briefly. Lichens, uh, some of us have seen some of them out of the preserve, maybe. You've definitely seen them in your life, even if you weren't paying attention. You've probably seen lichen growing on trees or rocks or anywhere outside. So they're everywhere. There's a ton of diversity. Um, tons of different types of, of lichens. But the cool thing about these is that they don't exist without symbiosis. So it is a uh, fungus, almost always an ascomycete, and a photosynthetic microorganism. And it can be an algae, so a eukaryotic photosynthesizer or a cyanobacteria. Those two species are always there. Without one or the other, you don't get a lichen. For that reason, uh, lichens are often used as bioindicators of the health of an ecosystem. Because if you throw off the conditions and you kick out one of those species, the lichens disappear. So if you know that this ecosystem generally supports a healthy population of lichens and they're gone, you can sort of indicate that something um, is going on there. There's also some interesting-ish 
depending on your perspective, I guess, new research on um, the symbiosis, because forever we thought it was those two symbionts, the ascomycete and the photosynthetic microorganism, but now there's evidence that there's always a third part. So always learning new stuff. That's not on here, so you don't have to worry about it. It's interesting stuff. All right, this is one of those Easter eggs. I'm not going to play it. I'm not even going to ask you to watch it. This will be bonus. Okay, so this is just a video about um, leaf cutter ants. It is an example of uh, animal and fungal mutualism. Okay, so a partnership where both uh, members benefit. So it's like two and a half minutes or something. So maybe take a look at it if you have time. And then the important stuff is all summarized for you in the next slide. So I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, if you see questions about leaf cutter ants, it'll be bonus. Okay, so Easter egg. Last thing we'll talk about here, human specific benefits of fungi. So let's see, commercial applications in agriculture. This is a kind of a cool one. So pesticides, you can use fungal pathogens as pesticides. So just like we have fungi that can attack us, there are, there are fungi that specifically cause disease in arthropods or insects. Okay, so if you've got an insect population that is chewing on your crop plants, you can apply a fungus to your plants that don't hurt the plants and don't hurt us that eat the plants, but infect the, the arthropods and insects that are chewing on your plants and kill them. So it's like a species specific non chemical pesticide. That's kind of a cool application. Um, you can also add spores from fungi that do good, healthy mycorrhizal interactions with plant roots. You can add the spores to the soil as what you call an inoculant, which just basically means you mix it in there and you expose the soil to it. Um, it's kind of like fertilizer, but it's fungus. So you put the spores in the soil, you mix it all in there, you grow it next to your plants. You have provided those species that will grow those mycorrhizal interactions with the plant roots. So lots of applications in agriculture. Food and beverages. So what kind of fungi do you eat? Talked about one of them, right? Edible mushrooms. Who likes mushrooms? A couple of people. Most people are like, yeah, right? Not uh, necessarily super popular. Um, interestingly, there's a whole new, that's not, not really new, it's probably a decade or older, um, line of meat substitutes that are grown from, what it's called mycoprotein. So it's not mushrooms, but it's some other kind of kinds of fung fungal hyphae that are grown in the lab somewhere, but the pro they're so full of protein that you can actually make them into like veggie burgers and uh, chicken, yeah, chicken esque nuggets and things like that. So there's lots of food products that can come from uh, fungi, it's not just mushrooms. So that's kind of interesting to think about. Um, we use molds all the time and things like cheese. And then how about fermentation? Anyone of age to partake in uh, alcoholic beverages? Yeah, beer, wine, anything that you ferment is going to be a product of yeast. Yes? So whether you choose to imbibe or not, that's where it comes from. Brewer's yeast uh, for beer and wine and other alcohol. Um, and baker's yeast, they're the same thing, same species. That's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You might want to know that term, that name, just to sort of know what I'm talking about. Um, brewer's yeast and baker's yeast, both, both the same thing. What do you use baker's yeast for? Bread, yeah, the bread to dry. So they make uh, carbon dioxide when they um, ferment. So we use them for food and beverage. Medicine and research, that's our last category. Um, this is a big one. What is this? Discovery of penicillin? Why is that significant? What's it's part of like the medicine replacement. Yeah, antibiotics. Medical revolution. I right? changed the human population forever and our ability to combat bacterial infection. Totally accidental uh, discovery. Okay. I'd love to talk about it, but we're running out of time, so we'll let you guys just read about it on the okay. Again, one of the Easter eggs, you might see bonus questions, not a required thing, just an interesting story. Other drugs, um, cyclosporine is an immunosuppressant. When would you take an immunosuppressant? What did it say? Transplant drugs, yeah. So what does it mean to you? What does immunosuppressant mean? What am I talking about? Suppressive. Yeah, suppresses your immune system, right? Or pushes it down, right? So when would you want that? Well, if you get a transplant, tissue or organ transplant, you don't want your immune system to attack, right? And so you take immunosuppressant drugs 
Um, so that's what cyclosporine is, and it comes from a, fun, a fun bit, fungus. Um, here's ergot again. Yes, the same compound that's used to make LSD is also used to make medications that help stop bleeding. Remember, we said that um, ergot fungus can cause gangrene if cow eat it, which means it constricts your blood vessels, okay, which leads to loss of blood flow to your tissue, which leads that tissue to die, which is gangrene. But if you need to stop bleeding, that vasoconstriction is valuable, right? So we've also used alkalo alkaloids from ergot to make those types of medications. Um, and then this last little bullet point about Neurospora uh, frassa, which is another species of yeast. And again, their Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the same yeast that you use for uh, beer and bread, are also used a ton as model organisms in research. So they are easy to grow, they're yeast, they're single cell, they're eukaryotes, just like us. Uh, we have sequenced the genome. It's very small, so it's easy to work with. So tons of applications for cellular research, genetic research, and so forth. So those are really common, uh, what we refer to as model organisms. So, so much more than mushrooms. Yeah. All right, guys, that's fun job. How much you have learned? You guys have questions about what I want you to know about fun job? All in your study guide. Um, you see the theme now how the, each each chapter is following the same pattern: characteristics, evolutionary relationships, notable species. Yes. Okay. So those are the types of things that you'll need to know. But again, use your um, use your study guides. They should be very very helpful. All right. Take a stretch. We're going to move into plants. Who likes plants? Cool, a couple people, good. They're very important and they're way more interesting than you might think that they are. So we'll hopefully spend some time to talk about that. Hopefully change your mind maybe if you think plants are boring and dull. Even if you think plants are boring and dull biologically, uh, you can't deny their importance to the human race, right? So we've talked about some of these reasons already. Uh, photosynthetic organisms, pumping out oxygen, sucking in carbon dioxide, right? Great for those of us who use oxygen for cellular respiration, right? So good thing there, photosynthesis. That's a ecological level benefit. Um, contribute to soil formation and erosion control. Anybody ever worked in landscaping? When you build a new neighborhood, for example, um, and you have to go in and cut down a bunch of trees, what's the first thing you do after you build the houses or the office complex? To the dirt that's surrounding it. Mm -hmm. Grass, right? Or some other kind of uh, ground cover because plant roots hold soil in place so it doesn't wash away. Um, but it also, plant roots, you can kind of see this picture is a little dark, but um, this is tree roots that are holding this bank in place. So maybe maybe this is the edge of a river, I'm not even 100% sure, it could just be a ditch. But the only reason that this land right here is not collapsing into this, into this open area is because these plant roots, these tree roots are holding it there. Um, so it's maintaining, uh, it's preventing erosion, but it's also causing erosion because a lot of times you get soil forming because you have plant roots digging down into the substrate they're growing in. Okay, so they break up rocks um, and larger pieces of, of uh, particulate matter, making it smaller, contributing to soil formation. So make soil and hold it in place, which is really going to be important, again, at the ecological level. Um, but then when we get to this bullet, this is fun, right? Because we're talking about people again, and that's us, so it's interesting. We talked about nutrition. Everything you eat comes from a photosynthesizer at some point, right? Even if you're talking about um, your pizza, right? You don't think photosynthesis when you think pizza. But where did the grain come from that was used to make the flour that you put in the crust? Plants, right? What about the cheese? The cheese is made from milk and the milk came from the cow. Where did the cow eat? Plants, right? So even if you don't eat a strictly plant-based diet, everything you eat comes from plants at some point along the way. Medicine, lots of compounds that we use for medications are plant-derived, okay? We'll talk about that if we get a chance. Um, building materials like wood and wicker and rattan and bamboo, all types of things that we use to build stuff. Biofuels, when you go to the gas pump and you see that 10% ethanol sticker, 
You guys know what I'm talking about? Where does that ethanol come from? Corn. Yeah, mostly. Um, and then clothing. We're probably all wearing cotton or some other plant, uh, plant fiber that you've uh, picked up along the way. So really, really uh, heavy reliance on plants for our way of life. So really important groups. So even if you think the biology part is important, they're important um, in other ways. All right, on to the characteristics of the group. So let me also preface this by saying there are two plant chapters, 25, which we're on now, and then 26. They're only split into two chapters because one, the first chapter covers plants that don't make seeds, and the second chapter covers seed plants, okay? They're all plants. So when we're talking about the importance or the characteristics, these are going to carry through both chapters, okay? So it's really just a dividing line in the diversity, but in the group that we'll talk about. So all of the stuff that we're going to intro in chapter 25 is going to apply as we move into 26, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, same idea that I told you guys about in fungi, between 300 to 400,000 catalog species, which means species that we've identified and taxonomically classified, yes? So maybe a um, million more, because it's the same sort of, the same sort of idea. Um, it's, a, it's a loose number. You don't need to memorize it, just know that it's always going to vary depending on who you ask, because of different classification systems and the fact that we haven't found them all yet, probably. Um, the vast majority of plant species are vascular plants. The first group we're going to look at are non-vascular. Okay, so that will make more sense here in just a minute. Um, but look at this. Only about 10,000 to 12,000 maybe species of plants are non-vascular. Let's go with the high-end estimate that there are about 400,000 species on the planet. That's a very small percentage that are non-vascular. Okay? We'll look at why that's important. It's actually kind of So about 94% of all the plants that are extant today, meaning on the planet, which you can find on the earth somewhere, are angiosperms, which we'll get to in chapter 26 as a group, but angiosperms are flowering plants. So plants that you're familiar with that make flowers. They might be huge and showy and gorgeous. They might be tiny little, little flowers, but they make flowers for reproduction. Really successful strategy. Okay, because 94% of the plants that are alive today do that. And that's a really significant evolutionary uh, step in plants. And we'll talk about that as we move forward as well. Most species of plants are photosynthetic. You guys know that, right? Why did I say most? Some aren't, right? You definitely have some examples of plants that do weird stuff, like eat other plants. Yes. Or eat insects. You guys have heard of Venus flytraps probably before, or pitcher plants, things that actually trap animals in and digest them. So plants do some weird stuff. Uh, some of them are parasitic on fungi. So they take that relationship, that mycorrhizal relationship that's supposed to be sharing, but instead of giving any sugar, they're stealing inorganic nutrients from their fungal partner, but they're also stealing sugar. How does that work? The mushroom's not making any sugar. The fungi is not producing any. But guess what it's doing? It has other mycorrhizal interactions with other photosynthetic plants. So you've got a plant, a fungus, another plant. This photosynthetic plant is providing sugar to the, to the um, fungus in exchange for mineral nutrition. So this fungus makes the same relationship with this guy over here, only this guy is not going to play nice. You're just going to steal both the sugar from this plant and the inorganic nutrition, just take and take, right? So parasitic plants. Um, so interesting, weird biology. There's a whole chapter on plant nutrition that we're not going to have time to cover. It's kind of a bummer. There's interesting stuff. But that's the reason for the statement most are photosynthetic, right? Um, you are familiar with chloroplasts and chlorophyll, probably. Chloroplasts are those cellular organelles that do the photosynthesis, and chlorophyll is the green pigments right, that um, contribute to that process. Um, you see sexual and asexual reproduction in plants, so you can see things like um, clones that just grow on their own. You, sometimes you can break off a piece and plant it somewhere else, and it'll grow into another whole plant, so it doesn't necessarily have to do the whole pollen thing. Okay, so you can see both examples. Um, definitely cell walls. We've seen cell walls in bacteria made of peptidoglycan. Remember that? We saw cell walls in fungi. 
made of what? Do you guys remember? Chitin, yep. And in plants, it's cellulose. Cellulose is also important to us because that is fiber. Okay, we can't digest it really well, but it's really helpful for our digestive processes, water absorption, uh, keeping you keeping things moving in your intestine. So that's your dietary fiber that when you eat plant foods, that's where that comes from, is that cell wall. Plants are also going to display indeterminate growth. This is a new term that we haven't really talked about in many of our, of our other groups yet. And it's going to make probably more sense when we contrast indeterminate growth with a determined body plan. And when we get to animals, after midterm, we'll talk about that predetermined body plan, but you kind of already know what I'm talking about. So when you're born, after you develop into a, an infant and you're born, then you grow to be your adult size and then you stop, right? When and if something catastrophic happens, if you lose a limb, does it grow back? Not yet, right? Scientists are working on it, but we can't do that. So we have a predetermined body plan, genetically programmed, to get you to a certain size and shape, and then you stop. Okay, plants are indeterminate, which means that they can continue growing body mass across their lifetime. It doesn't mean that a dandelion can grow as tall as an oak tree, but what it means is that same dandelion plant can keep putting out new leaves, new leaves, new flowers, and so on and so on. Okay, so that's what indeterminate growth means. And plants are, are cool like that, that's what they do. Okay, that's characteristics. Shall we talk evolution? We've got plenty of time. You guys ready? Some of this you've seen already. You've seen this tree, right? This looks familiar. What is this? What is this tree? Six what? You guys recognize it? What are these six groups? Eukaryotic supergroups, yeah. So these are just those classifications of all eukaryotes. Here's Lika for our last universal class. You carry how to come an ancestor. And then here are those six groups. Most of these we covered when we talked about protists. We throw them all into the protist group. Um, but we talked about how animals and fungi fall into this uh, clade. And then here we are with land plants in the Harpoplastida. And so that's where we are now. Land plants' closest relatives are the carophyte green algae. We mentioned that in chapter 23, and I told you we'd spend more time talking about it. And now we're there. Okay, so we're going to talk about that relationship. Um, and then outside of the carophyte and land plants relationship, you've got the chlorophyte green algae and the red algae. They all have one thing in common, and that is plastids, chloroplasts. Okay, this is the group, Archoplastida is the group in which the chloroplasts first evolved through, remember this? They just talked about it, endosymbiosis. Okay, so chloroplasts were originally free living cyanobacteria. Somebody in this group. The ancient ancestors of the Archoplastida engulfed a cyanobacteria. Those cyanobacteria over generations became organelles. Okay, so Archoplastida is important because that's the origin of chloroplasts. It's the origin of photosynthesis in eukaryotes. So other groups like the chromalbulates that have things in them that are also photosynthetic, these guys, say for example, um, brown algae. So they have chloroplasts, but they have them because they engulfed an archoplastid. You guys with me? Secondary endosymbiosis. So we touched on that a little bit. These guys, the archoplastida, are credited with the original chloroplast. Okay, so OG chloroplast. All right. Um, current evolutionary thought based on molecular systematics every time is that all plants are descendants of a single common ancestor. Okay, we'll talk about what that might have looked like uh, here in the archoplastida. First chloroplast. And we'll talk about this. This is also kind of cool. Early ancestors of terrestrial plants. What does terrestrial mean? Land, living on the land, as opposed to what? Aquatic, right? We can water. Um, so early terrestrial plants had to overcome significant challenges associated with the transition to life on land. So the ancestor of this group, right? The green algal ancestor that gives rise to land plants was aquatic. Algae are aquatic, largely, right? So land plants, when we talk about this group, we're talking about all plants, all right? Now, are there plants that you guys know of that live in the water? Sure, right? But those are later lineages that would have arisen after the move of the early plant species that came from green algae onto land. 
Okay, so plants basically move out of the water onto land. Millions of years of evolution, some of them move back, kind of like whales in the animal group, okay, or dolphins. All right, so we'll talk a little bit more about that evolutionary history. Okay, so here are some terms that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, all I really want you to know are these basic definitions that are on this slide, okay? So this is evidence that supports the relationship between uh, land plants and carophyte algae. The question, as you can see on the, on the title here, is are the carophytes a separate group or should you lump them in with plants? I know, it's a very exciting question. But it's a question of phylogenetics, right? So this is one of those things that's still being researched and being uh, considered and sort of debated. So there are some things that the carophyte green algae have in common with land plants. And the important thing to remember here is that these characteristics are not shared by the chlorophyte. So the chlorophyte algae, just to go back again, are here. So they're both two groups of green algae, but they're different enough from each other to be separately uh, classified based on structures, which we'll look at here in a second, and based on molecular systematics, so looking at genetics. So uh, carophytes and land plants have these things in common, and chlorophytes don't. Okay, so chlorophytes are for sure an outgroup on that tree. Okay, not lumped in plant with, but some phylogenetists, some plant systematists want to put the carophytes in the land plants, and here's why. So they both have plasmodesmata. You might have heard that term before when you studied um, cell organelles and plant cell structures in bio one. You might not have talked about it. If you did talk about it, you might not remember. But plasmodesmata are just connections between uh, so plant cells. So if you are a multicellular organism, but you have cell walls, there have to be connections between those cell walls so that nutrients can flow, so that information can flow, so that waste materials can be transported, right? So your cell wall can't seal you off from other cells that are adjacent. Um, and so plasma desmata are those connections between adjacent cells, from cytoplasm to cytoplasm through the cell wall that allow things to flow uh, from one cell to the next. So land plants have them, carophyte algae have them, chlorophytes don't. So that's just a shared characteristic. The phragmoplast is a cytoskeletal structure that happens, uh, that forms during uh, cytokinesis. You guys may remember this as well. When mitosis happens in plant, in plant cells, it works the same way as it does in animal cells, with one small exception, because animal cells don't have cell walls, they just do this. Yes, they just blip apart. Cytokinesis is easy in a, an animal cell. You just have that contractile ring, right, that squeezes in in the middle and they pop apart into two new animal cells. But plant cells have to reform a new cell wall. Does that ring a bell? You guys remember that? Yeah. So as the new plant cell wall is forming, you first have a precursor to that cell wall called the cell plate as it's just sort of being assembled. And there are cytoskeletal elements, microtubules, and other things that connect and pull stuff, right, from different locations in the cell to start building that cell plate. The phragmoplast is a shared cytoskeletal system for building the cell plate. Carophytes have it, or chlorophytes don't. Okay, but carophytes and land plants share that in common. So they both have phragmoplasts. Riveting, right? Okay. Um, and then apical growth. So carophyte algae and land plants both do this as well. They have that indeterminate growth. They can put on new tissue throughout their lifetime, but it only happens at the tips. So shoot tips and root tips. You guys know where the roots are, right? They grow which direction? Down usually into the soil. Um, so the growth is only happening at that tip of the root that's digging down into the soil. The rest of it is sort of just uh, non-mycotic tissue that's permanent tissue that's already been formed. So there's like um, marrow stem tissue, actively mitotic growing tissue at the tips of the roots. What do you think shoots are? Roots go down, which are the shoots grow? Up, stem, leaves, flowers, all of those things are gonna be shoots, okay? But the growth is only happening at the tip. That's apical growth. Apical uh, just means like apex. You guys know the word apex? If you make it to the apex of the mountain, you made it to the tip, right? Um, okay, so those three characteristics are important. You'll see a couple questions about those. 
important because again, parasites and land plants have those chlorophytes cannot. Okay, they do things a little bit differently. Um, okay, yeah, so this is just summarizing what I just said, along with molecular data. So looking at the genetics places these things in the same group, um, which is a monophyletic group, which is collectively called the streptophytes. So again, back to the tree. This group here, parasites plus land plants are labeled together as the streptophytes. You'll see that term one more time, okay, in this whole chapter. So just kind of be familiar with that. You guys okay? That's a lot of information. But again, these, you just need to know what I'm talking about, okay? I can envision a question that's something like, all of these are shared by parasites and plant plants except. Right, so if you know these three and I throw in a weirdo on you, you can pick out which one doesn't belong, right? That'd be the type of question you probably see on that. Or otherwise, a definition type question, like what are they? Okay. All right, let's talk about how this would have happened and when. So around somewhere between 850 to 450 MYA. What does that mean? MYA. Anybody? Million years ago, yeah, exactly. It's just an abbreviation. Um, this would have been what those groups would have looked like. So you've got your ancestral chlorophyte algae, mostly marine, so living in the salt water. Then you've got your ancestral streptophytes. So we're talking about, remember, uh, carophyte green algae, and they belong in that streptophyte group of land plants. So that's what this group is, and they were largely freshwater. Okay. Then over time, you end up with some mixing. So you get some chlorophyte species moving into freshwater and some streptophytes or carophyte algae moving up onto land, giving rise to the very first land plant, which would have been about 500 million years ago, okay? So the first time that algae, carophyte green algae, crawl up onto the, onto the land. How do they really crawl? No, right? So they're algae, they can't do that. Um, but what we would imagine would be something like on the edge of a freshwater habitat, you may have algal species that are well adapted to living in the extreme shallows. You guys with me so far? So if you live right here in a freshwater ecosystem, when you get a lot of rain, what happens to the water level? It's gonna go up, right? So you better be well adapted to living completely underwater if you are a non-modal algae, right? Because algae can move. Um, and then what happens in a freshwater ecosystem when it doesn't rain for a long time? For the water level. Oh, it's going to go down. So you also, if you live right here, you better be adapted to living in drought conditions too. So you've got this population of carophyte green algae living on the edge, okay? Evolutionarily speaking, highly adaptable, okay? I can live underwater and I can live dried out. And I'm cool with going in between. I am flexible. I have these, these characteristics that make me able to survive those types of conditions. And that's where it would have begun. Those conditions or those uh, characteristics that make you able to survive drying out are going to be selected for in those populations uh, as they start moving further and further away from the water. You guys okay? So those mutations that arise, those um, genes that you pick up through HDT, who knows where those variations originally came from, but those characteristics allow these guys to sort of creep a little bit further and a little bit further up the shore. And so you see diversification of all the species that we now see today. But this took 500 million years, okay? So this has been quite a long time ago. Again, it's one of those geological time scale type of um, questions. So what we're gonna talk about next, probably have time to cover most of this part of the chapter today, are, um, the adaptations that you would have seen in those algae that would have given them the ability to start moving out and living on dry land as opposed to aquatic uh, environments. And we'll also talk about why there was selection for that. Why was it helpful to move out of the water? Why did it happen in the first place, okay? So that's where we're headed with this. The first thing, we're, we've already mentioned it, but we'll talk about it in a little bit more uh, detail with that resistance to desiccation. If you've never seen the term desiccation before, it just means drying out. Okay. After I've been talking for an hour, my mouth is desiccated. Okay. I need some water. Um, so that's what that is. So those algae would have had to be able to tolerate at least some degree of desiccation. Okay. So you've got some adaptations for that. 
Eventually, you see drought tolerance, which, are, which refers more to species like cacti that live in places like the desert. They have adaptations that allow them to survive in those conditions. Okay, that's an extreme example, but you guys, it's a good, a good example to use that's usually familiar with when you guys know cacti are important. So early on, the algae that were moving out onto land would have stayed relatively close to the water. Okay, so the first thing you would see would be colonizing damp, cool habitats near the water. You're not going straight to the desert. Right? And algae doesn't immediately go live in the burning hot Mojave, right? So early on, you're going to see colonization close to water. You're going to see it in shady habitats um, that remain moist. Later, we see adaptations in land plants that allow for this uh, adaptation to desiccation and, and eventually drought tolerance. Uh, cuticles and stomata are examples of those structures. So the cuticle, I don't know how much detail you guys got into in bio one when you looked at photosynthesis, but you may have seen the structure before. If not, we're going to introduce it. So this is basically a cross section of a piece of a leaf. You can see here it's a whole leaf. There's a little punch. We're looking at the punch from the side. So just to put you in perspective of what we're looking at here, um, you got palisade, you got spongy mesophyll. The mesophyll are all like middle cells, cells in the middle of the leaf. Um, you have upper and lower epidermis. Okay, so that's basically like skin. You guys know what your epidermis is? The outer layer of your skin. Same thing on plants. So there's epidermis. The cuticle is a waxy coating on the outer epidermis. Um, if you've ever seen a leaf in the rain, what does water do when it hits a leaf surface? Yeah, it beads up and rolls up, right? Because that cuticle is waxy. The waxes. You guys remember what group of macromolecules waxes are classified in? Proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, or things like that. Hmm? Might be saying something. Lipids, yeah, they're waxy, they're fatty, right? So water beads up and rolls up. So the cuticle is an adaptation to keep water. It seems like the way we were describing it is to keep water out, but it's not really. It's to keep water in, okay? So um, a plant leaf in the sun is constantly transpiring, which means it's losing water through that epidermis, okay? The cuticle is there to prevent that from happening, so sealing in the water that the plant has obtained through its roots, all right? So the cuticle is that sealing layer. The problem with that cuticle is that plants also have to be able to get gases in and out, and they do that through their epidermis as well, without the ability to import carbon dioxide and export oxygen, photosynthesis doesn't happen, right? So the stomata are these openings. See these tiny little pores that are drawn here? Here, here. Those are stomata. Sometimes you'll hear them just called stomates. Both are, both are appropriate. Um, so stomates are those regulated openings that allow for gas exchange. So you can have that waxy coat to prevent water loss, but you also have little holes to allow for gas exchange. The really cool thing about stomata is this piece. They're regulated. That means that the plant has the ability to control when they're open and when they're closed. So they are cells that react to um, things like temperature and water availability that will close the stomata if it's too hot and dry for photosynthesis to happen. If you're losing too much water through those open stomates, they'll close. And then when it cools off a little bit or there's more moisture available, maybe it's nighttime, depends on the plant and the environment, the stomates will open up again. It's safe to photosynthesize, you're not going to dry out. So some really cool adaptations um, to keep from losing water. And then, of course, you have other really extreme adaptations in things like cacti, which we mentioned, um, like succulent stems. What is a succulent stem? Do you guys know what that means? Something is succulent. Have you ever heard that term before? What does it mean? Juicy, okay? Full of water. So succulent stems, uh, photosynthetic stems and cacti are really unique because most of the time photosynthesis happens in leaves, right? In these um, in these cells in the mesophyll, but in cacti it happens in the stems. The stems of cacti are green. The big, fat, juicy cacti stems that you see. That's where photosynthesis is happening. The spines on a cactus are actually the leaves, but they've been reduced in the spines for two reasons. Number one. You reduce surface area that's exposed to the sun, 
so you don't have room for water loss to happen. So you reduce the evapotranspiration. What else do spines do for a cactus? Yeah, protect it. Why does it need protection? Yeah, why do, why do animals want to eat it? Succulent stems, and that it's full of water in the middle of the desert. So you see initially in almost all plants, you'll see cuticle, you'll see stomata, at least some variation. And then you see the extreme versions of these adaptations and things like cactus in the desert. Yeah. What about like air currents that are present? Yeah, so things like um, tropical epiphytes, right? Because she said air plants. You guys have, have you ever heard of air plants or seen them? They like sell them in tourist shops sometimes. You can find them, but they don't need soil. They actually have roots that are able to. Um, pull humidity out of the air. So that's how they do it. Is that kind of your question? Yeah. yeah, so they don't even need to have roots down in the soil. They can live like in the crook of a tree up high without any soil at all. And they can either pull moisture just right out of that humus that gathers in the crook of the tree or some just do it straight from the air. Pretty cool. Another, another good example of an extreme adaptation to living in sort of dry conditions. Yeah, see, plants do weird stuff. They're interesting. All right. Cool. Um, we'll get through this slide for sure, and then maybe we'll stop here. Uh, we'll see. So the next adaptation we're talking about here is structural support. So um, why is it important to have structural support as you are moving from the water to the land? Well, it's written right here for you. We'll talk about it. Air is less buoyant than water. What does that mean? When you are in, let me think, let's think back to when we were little kids and you're like in a swimming pool with your friends. You can take someone who weighs as much as you do, but you could never lift on dry land if you can pick them up in the water, right? You can't pick them up out of the water because guess what? Gravity. But in the water, water molecules help with buoyancy. So stuff floats more so in water than it does in air. Yes? You guys all know what I'm talking about? Everybody like pick somebody up in the pool before, no? Most of you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so water is more buoyant. So if you're gonna move out onto land, you have to be prepared to deal with gravity uh, as a more impactful force than you do in the water. So as plants, when plants first move out onto land, they aren't thinking, I gotta get big and strong so I can get tall, right? But over time, you see these adaptations that allow for plants to get bigger and bigger, taller and taller. Some of those um, adaptations include things like uh, reinforcement of your cell walls with, with molecules like lignin. You find lignin in woody plants, okay? So that the structure of the stems themselves gets structurally stronger, chemical composition changes. You also see uh, vascular structures, okay? This is where I first will mention vascularity. When we talked about that um, trait back on the first characteristic slide, we said the vast majority of species are vascular plants, okay, that a very small population, very small subset of species are non-vascular. When we talk about that vascularity, this is what we're talking about. Xylem and phloem, okay, those are plant vessels. Those are the tubes inside of plant tissue that carry water and that carry photosynthase. When I use the term photosynthase, what am I talking about? You guys heard that term before? It's products of photosynthesis. So largely sugar, but other organic molecules that are assembled from the same products of photosynthesis can get lumped into that group with all photosynthase. So you've got xylem, which largely is carrying water from the roots to the rest of the plant, and phloem, which is largely carrying photosynthetic products from the leaves to the rest of the plant. So they're sort of traveling in two different directions. Um, anybody ever eaten celery? Yeah. So when you break a celery stick and you try to pull it apart, you know those springs, or you're like chewing it and you're like picking them out of your teeth because they're really tough? That's xylem. Okay, xylem and phloem, vascular bundles. It allows for transport of things like water, of things like photosynthetic products across longer distances. So if you don't have those vascular structures, your only means of transporting things like water and nutrients is diffusion. You guys remember diffusion. It's, it's powered by a concentration gradient, yes? So if you get too big, diffusion doesn't work effectively anymore. So you're limited by 
your lack of vascularity because you're limited by your ability to transport things across long distances until you see the evolution of vascularity for transport. The cool thing about xylem and phloem is that they're also reinforced with some of those more rigid molecules in many cases, which allows for both transport and structural stability. So you can grow taller and taller. Make sense? Um, additionally, we talked about apical growth. I mentioned meristem tissue. Meristem is uh, continuously mitotic, meaning cell division is ongoing all the time. And this is happening at those apices or those tips, root tips and shoot tips. That meristem tissue continues to divide. Here's a picture of micrograph of shoot apical meristem. Actively mitotic cells are stained in purple. So you can see at the tip, this is probably growing into a flower, if I had to guess, probably going to be a flower bud. Um, these are those mitotic uh, apical meristem that a shoot tip. This is the same thing in a root tip. Anybody ever look like a root? Uh, an onion root tip slide in bio lab. Maybe, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But you can actually count the number of cells that are undergoing mitosis in the uh, root tip marathon. This is classified under that um, structural support because that, that um, strategy of growing down into the soil and up at the shoots also helps with structural stability and size. So as your roots continue to divide and continue to grow down into the substrate, the more and stronger, better developed root system you have, what does that mean for how you can go this way? It's helpful, right? So the more stable your root system is, the bigger you can grow up against gravity, yes? So you have the ability to get taller and taller, the more root cell, uh, cell division you have, the more stable your root system becomes. Last question, and then we'll stop for today. Why is it advantageous to grow upward? What are you getting closer to? The sun. If you can grow taller than your neighbor, you are out competing that neighbor for access to the sun. Do you ever see plants that shade out other plants? Absolutely, right? So we're thinking in terms of these uh, characteristics that allow success as you're looking at evolutionary adaptation to life on land somewhere, right? Okay? So we'll stop there. We've got a couple more adaptations to talk about. These are a little chapter get through. And then why it happened. And then some group. So we're making excellent progress. I'm pleased with where we are. Appreciate your attention as always.